Hi and welcome back to 90 Day Dental Day 55. So we're nearly halfway through uh, special care dentistry. We started a brilliant topic yesterday and talking about assessment and today we're moving on to part two with Natalie Bradley. Take it away Natalie. Welcome back to day two of special care for 90 Day Dental where today I'm going to be talking about when to refer special care patients on. So firstly I'd like to talk about what special care dentistry actually is because I think there's some pre uh, misconceptions about what the specialty encompasses, not just within the profession but within the public. So special care dentistry deals with patients who have impairment or disability, but this can include patients for example who have, got dental, who have dental phobia, who have physical disabilities, who have complex medical problems. How would you like to be that patient who has called special needs just because you have a dental phobia? Or special care, what does that mean to you? The more up-to-date and fashionable term that I would like to use is additional needs. So special care dentistry provides all dentistry to patients who have additional needs. And according to the GDC, this involves patients who have might have physical, sensory, mental, emotion, emotional, intellectual, or social impairment. And remember, we only deal with patients who are 16 plus. If any patient who, who is under 16 falls into any of those categories, please, please, please send those on to our, my paediatric colleagues. Where are special care patients seen? So you might see patients uh, that fall into this remit in general practice, but generally as well, um, community dental services um, throughout the country also provide service in the community for these patients, and also hospital dental service um, has a huge a remit for a lot of these patients simply because of some of the treatments we have to provide need a medical input in secondary care. In terms of where you need to look about um, where which patients need to be seen where, the best place to look is the NHS England's Commissioning Guide for Special Care Dentistry and that will talk about levels of care and um, where level one is something that our GDP can see and level two which is generally where commun commu um, encompass community dentistry is maybe dentists who have a little bit more skills so a specialist interest in these areas and then level three is the hospital dental service generally or specialist dental service. Special care patients don't necessarily just fit into one of these services many chop and change between which, um, each of the services depending on what their needs are at that specific time and what we call shared care. So it might be that you might be asked as a GDP to do checkups and prevention for a patient who just who ha then has treatment in the community or also has uh, might have treatment in the hospital. So this is why you need to know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to send to us because there's not many special care dentists. Just because some of the patients that we see take more time or need acclimatisation visits for example doesn't mean they automatically fit referral criteria to be seen by special care. Um, so just bear that in mind. Sometimes it does, um, but it's in also within a remit of a general dental practitioner to provide acclimatization appointments or just spend a bit longer with some of these patients. So let's go from this through some of the patient groups that I see um, and when you need to consider referring these patients. Um, bearing in mind, um, although I talked about those, um, the criteria for what falls within special care dentistry, um, general Generally, many of our patients don't just fit into one of these boxes of, yeah, they have a, a mental disability, no, they have a social disability. Most of them tick several boxes and overlap. Um, special care patients don't generally fit in boxes very well. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. So firstly, let's talk about patients who might have a learning disability. Just because a patient has a learning disability doesn't mean that they necessarily need to be seen by a special care dentist. Learning disability is a huge spectrum. It could be quite mild, where a patient can, is fully cooperative, uh, understands what you're saying, can manage treatment with a local anaesthetic, and that's absolutely fine for them to be seen in general practice. But when things get a bit more complex, when they have some medical comorbidities, so some patients who have Down syndrome might have cyanotic heart defects, which increase, increases their risk of infective endocarditis, so they need, might need to be seen in secondary care or patients with autism uh, might have epilepsy that's not very well controlled and so you might want them to be seen in secondary care too. So that complicates the situation. They might have complex social problems and you might be worried about safeguarding. In that case, being seen by the community um, or um, a special care dentist might be more appropriate. And of course, things about cooperation is really important. If a patient has very poor cooperation and can't manage treatment with a local anaesthetic, then that's something we might be able to help with. 
Also, some patients who have learning disabilities like routine and familiarity. So actually being seen by the same dentist and same team in the same surgery in a dental practice that's close to them or close to their care home might be more appropriate than sending them all the way up to a specialised clinic where it's difficult for them to get to, they get distressed if they're on public transport um, and they see a different dentist every time in an unfamiliar environment. So that's something else to take into consideration. We also see lots of patients who have multiple comorbidities. The thing to remember with multiple comorbidities is that if that medical condition doesn't affect the dental treatment that you're giving them, then there's not really an indication to send it off to a special care dentist. Generally, especially in hospital, we see ASA 3 patients and above. So that's people who've got severe systemic conditions. Um, that actually imp um, impacts a patient's function in um, general day-to-day -day life. So that might be they have uncontrolled diabetes, or they've recently had an MI, or they've got really severe COPD and they're breathless on walking. We also might see patients who are on certain medications that really impact their dental treatment. So things to remember are bisphosphonates and anticoagulants and antiplatelet drugs. Um, some of these patients might be able to manage in, second, in primary care, um, but sometimes they might need a bit of shared care where if they have a particularly difficult tooth taking out and you're worried about their coagulation and clotting, then referring it on is appropriate. But the what I would look at um, for those is looking at the Scottish um, SDCEP guidance, so they're very straightforward and they actually tell you when, when it's appropriate to get a specialist input. The reason why you might refer these patients who've got complex medical problems to us is that we ha have um, greater capabilities for closer liaison with medical teams. Um, I work with an anaesthetist generally once a week and that's the best person to ask about medical problems. And also if you're referring to a, a hospital environment and um, patients who've got more unstable disease that you're worried about acutely worsening and having a medical emergency, we have the equipment and the skills and the staff to be able to manage that much better. Another patient group that we see and you could refer to as are patients who are scared of the dentist. Don't uh, refer everyone who's absolutely scared to the dentist to us because if, if you look and do some reading around, generally, I mean, up to about 50% of the general population have a fear of the dentist. About 10 to 12% have a severe phobia. And that's why it end up um, need to be seen by a special care dentist. Look at your local referral pathways because sometimes these patients go to sedation practices rather than to the um, special care units and some special care units don't accept dental phobias. Um, but when a patient can't actually manage their treatment with you, so after you've spent um, a good time building rapport with them, helping them relax, giving them a bit longer time, even if then they're not even sitting in a dental chair, then maybe that's the time to consider referring. We can offer non-pharmacological ways of how we manage their dental anxiety, or of course we have the sedation route too. And what about patients who have physical disabilities? So there's some obvious ones, like if a patient actually can't even get to your dental practice and they need a domiciliary visit, that generally falls into special care dentistry remit and we physically go to their homes because they can't get to us. That might be because they have, um, you know, they, they have a lot of physical disabilities, they're bed bound, they've got agoraphobia perhaps, or maybe they're an inpatient um, at a hospital, for example. Patients who are wheelchair bound might have to end up being seen by us, but that really depends. Um, being wheelchair bound, again, there's a spectrum of that. It might be that they can get out of their wheelchair and transfer to your dental chair with no assistance, no problem. It might be that you have a ground floor surgery with a, you know, doors that are wide enough to let the, dental, when the wheelchair through and you can have a look in their mouth um, without getting them out of their wheelchairs. But it might be, or, or they might have those wheelchairs that, that tip back, so you can actually just get them tipped back in their wheelchair and you can do your dental treatment that way. But it might be that um, the patient can't transfer or you've got a, you're on a second floor and no lift. In that case, getting them to see us is a good option because we have things like wheelchair tippers, um, hoists and things so we can actually see them and provide their dentistry. Also think about the weight limit of your dental chair. I hope you all know the weight limit of your dental chair. Generally you're looking around 23 stone. But if a patient is over the weight limit of your dental chair, you need to refer them onto a service that has a dental chair that can take that weight. Um, and generally that falls under special care remit as well. Some patients also have really hypersensitive gag reflexes that really impairs them being able to have any sort of dentistry whatsoever. 
I don't mean you just over patients who gag when you overload your alginate tray, patients who literally won't even let you put in a mirror in their mouth without gagging, or can't tolerate the denture that you've provided for them and it's not overextended and it's good and it's got good retention. That might mean that you need to refer them to us because we can do other things to help them manage their gag reflex as well. And finally, let's talk about patients who have mental health problems who might be socially excluded. So that might be patients who are homeless or are travellers or vulnerable migrants. Um, these patients tend generally have quite chaotic lifestyles and they might be difficult to manage. They might not be. They might be coming and completely cooperative uh, and let you do their treatment. Um, but it might be that they have comorbidities that, that make it difficult to manage them. So um, a lot of homeless people also might be al alcoholics and that might impair their liver function, what their clotting ability is like, oh, you need to get blood tests. Managing that in a special care environment might be easier. There might be consent and capacity issues that I talked about in yesterday's video. And that's when you might need a special care input as well, or complex social problems. But actually many of these patients, because of their chaotic lifestyles, might really struggle getting to see um, get through that referral process. By you referring them on somewhere else, that's just an additional barrier to care that you're giving for them. Um, so you need to get to know the patient. Actually, accessing dentistry through general dental practice is generally the easiest way to access dentistry for these patients. So um, rather than referring them on, it'd be great if you could see them if possible. And it just might mean you need to adapt things a little bit to co compensate for their chaotic lifestyles. So just lower your expectations in terms of what treatments and how long the treatment plans are, engaging with key workers, for example, to reduce their fail to attend rates or give text message reminders, or just being a bit more flexible about how you arrange their appointments and treatment planning. So these are all things to consider when you're thinking about referring a special care, den special care patient onto a special care dentist. Um, we are here to help. Please do not worry about if you're not sure. Please get in touch with your local service. I think special care dentists are generally the nicest dentists, I'm a bit biased, um, dentists out there. So if you're worrying about anything and you get in touch, you will generally get a good response. But what's really important for special care patients is really just adapting to their needs and not thinking everyone will fit into all these boxes that, you know, that patient will be seen by the CDS and that patient will be seen by the hospital. Generally, they flit and change between services and shared care is so, so, so important. Communicating between, with the patient and communicating with their carers and between services is, is really, really key because actually many of them will be able to be seen at some point in general practice for some point, some part of their treatment, whether it literally is just their three month recall and prevention checkups, or if that's some part of their treatment, making a denture, for example, and um, it really takes a load off special care dentists. Because as I say, there's not a huge amount of us and we can't see everybody who falls into all these categories. Um, I think everyone should be upskilled to be able to see these patients because generally the population of all these patient groups is increasing. People are living for longer, it means they're getting dementia, they're living longer with comorbidities, they're surviving the cancer treatments, people with learning disabilities are, are surviving in, into later adulthood. People, more and more people are being diagnosed with mental health problems and um, yeah, homelessness and stuff is increasing. So it should, treating these patients just, shouldn't just fall within the remit of special care dentists. Everyone should be able to do special care to a degree. It's an aspect of dentistry that I found it super useful to get from Natalie, simply because it's so nice to know what the protocols and everything is out there and what's available out there to help us support us through our practices and through our other working careers in the dental profession. So thank you so much for that uh, incredible update and I cannot wait to look forward to part three tomorrow. Like us, follow us, follow Natalie on Instagram as well and look at all the companies that have been supporting us throughout all of this. I know all of you are very busy preparing at the moment um, for various different uh, getting back to work schemes and protocols, but please do follow and give us the support as well. See you all tomorrow.